my name is Will McCarthy, and uh, I'm very uh, excited to be here at the uh, Boulder Bookstore virtual book signing event. Um, I, uh, I lived in Boulder for five years. I went to school uh, at uh, University of Colorado, and uh, during that time, I was a frequent patron of the Boulder Bookstore. I, I live in Lakewood, Colorado now, um, so I don't get to Boulder quite as often, but when I do, I usually try to uh, to stop by the Boulder Bookstore because they have uh, excellent selection. Um, so I am here to promote my latest uh, novel, Poor Man's Sky, out from uh, uh, Simon & Schuster in uh, January. And uh, so uh, I'm going to answer a few questions and then give a give a brief reading. <clears throat> so, um, the first question is, uh, uh, can you give us a short synopsis of your novel, No Spoilers? Um, the easiest way to do that, I think, is to talk about the themes of the novel rather than the plot, per se. Um, it's a novel that's set in the, in the near future when um, uh, access to space uh, and the resources of space are controlled by a small number of high net worth individuals. Uh, we see that happening right now. There are a number of uh, high net worth individuals with their own space programs. Uh, and so what the novel does is just roll that out uh, 30, 40 years in the future and, and see what, uh, what that looks like. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, one of the uh, one of the consequences of all of that, the um, uh, if you move off the Earth, then you're you're really kind of outside the reach of earthly law, and nobody can tell you what to do uh, per se. But you're still at the mercy of the people who work for you. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how rich you are if if you have uh, uh, workers who who. Uh, uh, make sure there's oxygen to breathe and stuff like that. You have to still uh, uh, pay some attention to that. So this is a story about even though uh, outer space is controlled by by uh, the wealthy, um, there are still uh, ordinary people who are living and working in outer space who have nevertheless uh, uh, started asserting their own power. Now. Some of that, unfortunately, involves people getting killed and uh, such. So there's there's a uh, a murder mystery element to this, um, uh, as well as kind of politics and labor disputes and stuff like that. But at, at its heart, it's a very sort of human story about ordinary people um, who are sort of uh, participating in small corners of this much larger. Uh, uh, set of machinations. Um, as far as what inspired me to write this book, um, the uh, uh, you know, as I said, this is happening right now. There are a lot of things that are happening right now that really point uh, toward the future. We've got generative AI and and things like that. But the thing that really um, kind of caught my uh, my attention here is just how. Uh, uh, increasingly, you know, governments are not launching their own rockets. They're not building their own space stations. They're not landing their own moon missions. They're farming this out to corporations who are, I, I, I guess, let me, let me back up because, you know, the Apollo program, uh, even though the, the government owned the rockets, uh, they were built by private enterprise. The difference is every component was bought from somebody and sort of assembled uh together you know you have this kind of pile of of components each one of which was built by the the lowest bidder uh and that's how we got to the moon um you know in the 60s and 70s but the difference is that increasingly we're seeing these vertically integrated monopolies um uh, companies like spacex uh and, and blue origin where they they just sort of build as much of it as they can uh and they they control they own the rocket they they, uh, uh, they're, they're selling a service uh, to governments. They're saying, okay, well, yeah, we'll, we'll put your thing up, whatever your thing might be, or we'll land your thing on the moon, whatever your thing might be. Or even we'll build the thing, we'll build the rocket, 
and we'll build the thing and we'll own the thing. Um, so anyway, that that shift from uh, governments having all the power to to industry having all the power and government merely accessing that power. Um, that shift is small right now, but I think it's profound in its implications. And if we look forward, I think those implications are going to uh, uh, become a lot more visible. So that's that's what inspired me to write this book. Um, <clears throat> now, the next question is, why did I decide to set this sci-fi murder mystery on, on a lunar monastery and center it around a reality show? Um, yeah, that's... That's a loaded question. That's that's kind of several questions at once. Um, but uh, yeah, why the um, uh, why the reality show first? Um, one of the things that's happening kind of in the background of this story is that a um, uh, hundred people are going to Mars and they're going to uh, establish a colony. The colony is actually already there. It's been built by robots, but they're going to move in and start inhabiting it and start the process of just really colonizing Mars. Um, but in terms of who's going, who those hundred people are, the selection process is a reality show. And again, that's just kind of extrapolating trends. Who's next in fashion? Who's the next big chef? Um, more and more, we're uh, uh, kind of consuming these reality programs that have a, a, an element of competition to them, but they also have an element of, of doing a, a a practical thing you know these are chefs who actually work in the real world or whatever so it seemed actually like a very logical way that if you're trying to decide uh, which hundred people uh out of out of the billions who live on earth which ones get to go to mars well a reality competition uh is a is a logical it's one logical way to do that uh it also <clears throat> because the the um Competition is actually also a fundraiser. Uh, that's part of how the the uh, uh, mission to Mars is being funded: is who can raise the most money um, uh, through their their competition. Um, but because the stakes are so high, because uh, you know what happens if you're in second place, what happens if you're in third place, um, uh, you know if you really really want to go to Mars, if that's your dream, if it's your lifelong dream, um, then those stakes are very, very high. And uh, my thought is, well, that's something that people would kill for. They have and and, and they will in the future. Um, so that's why the murder mystery element of it, and that's why the game show element. As for the monastery, um, and, and by the way, the whole story doesn't take place in the monastery. It takes place in lots of different settings. Uh, I'm, the real world is complicated. And if you look around at the present, the present time is very complicated. And there are a lot of different things that are happening in a lot of different places. And if you wanted to describe, for example, if you wanted to just write a book about 2023, um, you, you'd need to, to uh, get a couple of different viewpoints uh, in, in different places to really convey what's going on this year. Uh, and I'm trying to do the same thing in the, in the future. Um, but the, the monastery is there uh, because, you know, if you look at the, the way the Americas were settled, uh, uh, the, the Catholic Church played a large role in that, uh, and very sort of consciously so. Uh, and my thought was, well, they certainly have the resources uh, if access to space is easier and cheaper in the future, the Catholic Church certainly has the resources to participate in that. Um, and they might want to. They might want to play the same sort of role in outer space that they did in the Americas. Also, <clears throat> in thinking back to the Middle Ages, after the um, collapse of the Roman Empire, one of the things that, that uh, Roman Catholic monasteries did was kind of preserve civilization. They preserved documents. They copied uh, documents as they started to get old and and rot. So they were they were repositories of knowledge. They were they were libraries. They were universities. Um, and I thought maybe that that same role uh, going forward that um, 
it, the Catholic Church might send people to the moon with the mission of just kind of staying there for their entire lives, learning how to live on the moon and then teaching other people, not just on the moon, but learning how to live off the earth um, and uh, also teaching other people how to do it. <clears throat> so you have students that are visiting this this lunar monastery and and one of their they're members of this this reality show competition and and uh one of them gets murdered and that's kind of the the jumping off point for the for the story um so that's that's the why of of all of it um the uh next question is can you tell us about your writing routine um uh, you know people ask questions a lot about uh, what a writer's uh, methods are like. Uh, and I find that, that that's a, <coughs> it, it's of academic interest, I suppose, but it's not of any great utility. Um, every writer that I know has their own very sort of idiosyncratic uh, methods of, of doing things. Um, But uh, <clears throat> but mine, um, I uh, uh, have been a full time writer uh, off and on uh, over a career spanning at this point thirty years. But um, uh, a few years ago, I, I took a full time job uh, as a as a patent agent um, because I'm staring retirement to the face, and I thought it might be nice to have. Uh, you know, a 401k and health insurance and stuff like that. Um, uh, so I, these days I'm fitting my writing in around that job and uh, I have to go downtown in two, three days a week. Um, um, but I, I write on my, on my phone. Um, I uh, use Microsoft Word on my phone. And with predictive typing, I find that I can get by with with one finger typing. Uh, I, a long time ago, I used to use um, uh, a, um, I was early in on the on the handheld stuff. Back in the early 90s, I was using a, a, a device from Hewlett Packard called an HP 200LX, and then um, a device called a Scion, and I was a, an avid thumb typer. With virtual keyboards, I find that I can't, I can't thumb type uh, the, uh, uh, it's just not precise enough, but I can, I can one finger type and with predictive typing, that's just fine. And people are amazed. How can you write an entire novel that way? I mean, it's fine. It's not that hard. Um, but I write my first drafts, uh, that way. Um, and then I, I organize it all, uh, and edit on a, on a laptop, which is, that's a little bit easier to edit, but, uh, by doing it on my phone, I can do it anywhere. I can do it on the train um, downtown, and I can do it while I'm waiting for coffee. Or, uh, you know, I can I can also do it anywhere. I can do it in a hammock. I can do it in an Adirondack chair. I don't need to be tethered to a, a you know power outlet or anything like that. Um, and the for 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 these books the um, the challenge has been, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm telling the stories of different people in different locations. They all intertwine to sort of tell this larger story. Uh, but the result is the story is threaded. You've got one thread over here, you've got another thread over here. And my methodology, uh, which again, a lot of people find sort of horrifying, I write each thread uh, by itself end to end. I tell it as its own story. And then I take these completed stories and I shuffle them together. And then the, <laughs> the result is a lot of continuity errors. So I have to then go through the entire thing end to end several times um, to make sure that the larger story is, is being coherently told. Uh, and all of that is a lot of work, um, but it's, that's how I achieve the, the result that I, that I want to achieve here. So, um, Again, I'm not recommending that uh, that routine. I'm not recommending that that uh, methodology, but that's that's how I do it. Um, okay. Uh, next 
question is, do you have plans for another book set in this world? I do, yes. Um, the um, uh, This book, uh, Poor Man's Sky, is actually the second in a series. Now, I'll say, um, uh, this, I'll say trilogy for now, but <clears throat> um, the books are meant to be read in any order. I don't like um, series where you just, the book doesn't really end. Uh, you know, it, it, you just have to then pick up the next book and just start reading almost mid-sentence. I don't really like that style of, uh, of storytelling. So I prefer that each book have its own story. It's got its own beginning, middle, and end. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have said to me, oh, gosh, you left a lot of, you know, loose ends at, at the end of the book. You're, you're clearly trying to set up the next book. That's not true. I mean, it's true that there are loose ends. But again, what I'm striving for is this sort of hyper-realism where, um, you know, real life is complicated. Real life takes place, you know, in different different places. You know, real life can be confusing for the people that are involved in it. And real life leaves a lot of loose ends. Uh, so that's, I'm not like consciously trying to, you know, tell a, a story in, in multiple volumes per se. Um, so although this is the second book, um, in a, I want. I don't want to say a series. It's the second book in a setting. Um, uh, you don't need to read the first book to read this one. Uh, I am working right now on a third book. Um, the first book is called Rich Man's Sky, and then Poor Man's Sky is the the one that we're talking about today. Um, I'm working on a third one called Beggar's Sky, um, and they're different from each other. Uh, and uh, you know, they're they're you can read them all in a end to end if you want to, but you, you certainly don't need to. Uh, will there be a fourth book? Probably. I've started to to contemplate that, but um, once I finish Beggar's Sky, before I uh, uh, contemplate writing a, a fourth book in the same setting, I'm going to go off and, and do something different. Uh, it doesn't, you know, as an artist, uh, I, I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Um, I need uh, need to kind of stretch my wings and, and try different things, and you know more power to the people who can write thirty books in one in one series and never do anything else. I'm I'm not one of those people. Um, okay, the uh, next question: What are a couple of books you read during the pandemic that you really loved? Um, okay, a uh, little bit of background on before I before I answer that question. I'm a very slow reader. Um, I can almost write a book at the at the same speed that I can read one. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, uh, maybe it's a touch of dyslexia, or maybe I just like to overthink while I'm reading. But uh, it, it takes me a while to to uh, finish a book. Uh, so that's thing number one. And thing number two is that during the pandemic, um, for whatever reason, you know, uh, people reacted to it in different ways. I didn't read more, I read less, and I didn't write more, I wrote less. Um, I spent a lot of time just zoned out in front of the TV uh, or eating takeout food or just sitting in the backyard. Um, so I didn't get that much reading done during the pandemic, but what I did read was the uh, Count to a Trillion series by John C. Wright. Um, uh, I, I love that series, uh, and it's it's uh, become really my my favorite, uh, uh, at least at least my favorite science fiction. Uh, and it's interesting because my second favorite science fiction series is also by John C. Wright. So I would uh, classify him as my favorite writer, my favorite science fiction writer, at least. Um, uh, but. I find that every time I do that, I'm always disappointed by by that writer uh, uh, subsequent to that. So I don't have a favorite writer. I'm not going to declare a favorite writer. I just have favorite books. But that's what I read during the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I recommend them. I don't know, um, are those books similar to my writing? I don't know. I don't really think so. Um, 
I'm not claiming that I, I write in a manner that's similar to John C. Wright. But uh, anyway, if you uh, if you ever see the Count to a Trillion books by John C. Wright, I do uh, I do highly recommend them. Next question. Is there anything you else you want us to know about your book? No, I think I've covered it pretty well. Um, I think I've uh, uh, kind of talked a lot about about the the themes of the book and and the setting of the book. I don't want to talk too much about the plot um, because I think the plot should speak for itself. Uh, more the jumping off point for the plot. Uh, you know, if if the things that I'm saying make it sound like a book that you would want to read, then then uh, by all means read it. Um, I, I guess the um, you know I I've been an engineer and a scientist, and so my my approach to writing science fiction tends to be very nuts and bolts. And if you're talking about near future stories set in space, there's a lot about the uh, the dangers of space and kind of the the daily details of what it's like to live in space um so again just trying to strive for a high level of realism um so if you like that then then maybe you'll like this um uh can you read us a short passage from your book um uh, yeah absolutely uh i have uh, uh i'm going to read the uh, first first chapter chapter 1.1 12 November 2052, <clears throat> Orlov Petrochemical Compressed Gas Cargo Landing Vehicle Number 14, Lunar Orbit. Andrei Bakovsky had been tied up for sex a time or two, and he had once been in a helicopter crash. His present circumstance was a bit like doing both of these things at the same time. The ground below him was getting bigger and closer and bigger and closer, and he was strapped securely, face down, arms down, feet down. But instead of a blindfold, he had a fogged up spacesuit visor, dripping with condensation as the water droplets stopped being weightless and started being pulled downward along the clear plastic. Instead of pillows or flight seat hardware underneath him, he had the metal struts and tanks and pipes of the gas delivery lander poking up uncomfortably against the padding of his suit like the bars of a miniature jungle gym. And the ground rising up to meet him was the dusty cratered surface of the moon, which provided no sense of scale. He'd been strapped to this thing for hours, and he really didn't know if it could land properly with him on board, and he also couldn't tell how close he was to touchdown. Seconds, minutes, another hour? All he could say for sure was that there were craters rolling by, getting slowly bigger as they went. It helped that he'd put himself in this situation. It helped that he was escaping indentured servitude in search of sweet freedom. It helped that he was an experienced astronaut with literally hundreds of EVA hours in his logbook. But his oxygen consumption was high, very high, because he was hyperventilating, because this was way more terrifying than he'd allowed himself to expect. He was tempted to lean on the chin switch that would activate his radio on the emergency channel. He was tempted to call for help, but who could help him? What could they do? What would he even say? Andrei Bikovsky fell from the sky like a tank of cyanogen, like the tanks of asteroid harvested carbon nitrogen gas he'd pulled out of the lander a couple of hours ago, replacing them with his own body weight. He fell from the sky, cramped and cramping and half-blinded, thinking this was the dumbest thing he'd ever tried, and also, quite possibly, the last. And yet, as bad a day as he was having, he was out here for a reason. He had to remember that while he panted away his oxygen. <clears throat> had to remember that Grigory Orlov, by refusing paid shore leave for the workers of Clementine's Cislunar Fuel Depot, while also refusing to accept any resignations, had effectively made serfs of them all, without breaking any laws. It was intolerable, and somebody had to do something. Then again, the spasms in Andre's back and shoulders were also intolerable. He might almost welcome a fatal crash if it meant an end to this. Would it hurt if he died on impact? 
would he even know it happened? The forehead of his helmet was braced against a metal pipe, which hummed as the rocket engines beneath him fired. He couldn't see any flame, any gas belching out of them, but he could feel the deceleration, greater now than when it first had kicked on. Ten minutes ago? One minute? Hovering on the edge of panic, all his internal senses were scrambled, except for pain. His whole world was reduced to this crab-shaped delivery lander, or smaller than that, to the bubble of air inside his fogged-up helmet, to the loops of nylon holding his wrists and ankles, too far down, too far stretched, <clears throat> to the growing sensation of his own weight against a spindly structure never meant to bear it, a structure meant only to support the weight of a pair of gas cylinders against the weak pull of lunar gravity. If this were a dumber craft, his weight, heavier than the bottles he'd removed, would have thrown the trajectory off entirely. But it was smart enough to find its own way, though he did run the very real risk of, at any moment, running out of propellant and simply falling the rest of the way to the lunar surface. And so his whole life was reduced to this one endless moment, waiting in terror. But then something changed. He saw shapes drifting by beneath him, black and white and yellow and red, cylinders and rectangles casting long shadows in the slanting rays of the sun. Could it be? Was this the St. Joseph of Cupertino Monastery, three degrees of latitude off the lunar south pole? Had he arrived? The structures swelled alarmingly as he dropped towards them. Then they rotated out of view as the lander made some kind of automated adjustment. And all he knew was that he was falling fast and decelerating hard, and his breathing was so rapid and shallow he felt in real danger of passing out. And then he could see streaks of dust kicking out from the rocket plumes, and then he could see a long shadow throwing itself beneath him, and then he was in shadow, and then the lander touched down with an impact that was nearly hard enough to break his ribs. So that's the, uh, that's the start of the book. Um, and there are a hundred thousand more words, uh, which uh, uh, you may enjoy if you read the book. Um, so uh, I'd like to um, thank the uh, uh, Boulder Bookstore once again for inviting me to speak. And um, I uh, thank all of you for your attention. So bye now. <laughs>